Hi, everyone, and welcome to Resources for Early Career Scientists, Catalyzing Policy Change. I'm Holly Mayton, one of the co-directors and co-founders of the National Science Policy Network, and I'm really excited to be here with three of my friends and colleagues from NSPN, ESAL, and JSPG, which we'll tell you more about in just a few minutes. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in by introducing our, our first speaker, uh, which is Chris Jackson from ESAL. Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, or ESAL, is a national organization dedicated to increasing local civic engagement by people with STEM backgrounds. Our first panelist, Christopher Jackson, uh, is the Workshops Director at ESAL, and he's going to tell us about high-impact pathways for individuals with STEM backgrounds to shape policy in their communities through engagement with local policymakers. So, Chris, over to you. you just let me know when you want to advance the slides. Great, thanks so much, Holly. Um, as mentioned, my name is Chris. I'm the workshops director for ESAL. I'm excited to kind of share with all of y'all today in attendance um, some kind of ways you can engage with our organization, hopefully ways that we can support you um, as you kind of think about your career and kind of your pathway through science policy. Um, so a little bit about ESAL, who we are. We're a national nonprofit um, specifically dedicated to increasing civic engagement among scientists and engineers in your local community. So right around where you are, we typically think about local communities, anything from your state to your county to your city or even more local than that. So that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say local, which you hear me say many times. Um, how do we do that specifically? Um, we offer original content and curated resources, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides for STEM professionals across all career stages. I know we're mainly talking to early career folks today, but no matter where you are, we kind of work with folks across the spectrum um, who want to engage locally. Um, so if we can jump to the next slide and tell you a little bit about how we do that. Um, we have three kind of main branches that I'm gonna walk you through our blog, which is features interviews that we conduct with different people, organizations, and kind of deep dives into various topics on local engagement and STEM local engagement in particular. We provide the resources kind of recognizing that folks may need a hand in getting started. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our local engagement playbook today. And we also offer events kind of to build that community of folks who are passionate about these issues that really um, require scientific expertise and input um, and occur at the local level. And so we host kind of panels and workshops and a lot of different types of things, conference sessions like today's event. Um, so that jump into a little bit more detail about the next slide. Um, on our blog, we, as I mentioned, we kind of focus on different types of people and kind of really want to provide folks kind of recognizing that there are people doing this. There are probably people already doing this in your community. And there are people who are scientists and engineers who have the same type of training and background that you do, who are already doing this type of work. When we really just want to bring that to the forefront and kind of offer these kind of examples for ways that you can engage. Um, we have a couple different formats. We do that stories from the field, features kind of individuals, our local STEM um, platform focuses on organizations um, and kind of do postcards and deep dives, which focus on kind of other different aspects of that. I'm gonna just tell you a brief vignette today about one um, story that we featured on our blog a couple years ago now. Um, Catherine Kudrin and Mary Natoli, who at the time when we spoke to them um, were bioengineering PhD candidates at Rice University. So again, students, early career researchers, I'm um, working in the lab, maybe like many of y'all who are in attendance today. And in addition to being researchers, they were also avid cyclists in their kind of community of Houston. Um, and so what spurred their attention really got them interested in this idea of local engagement was a series of traffic accidents um, that occurred at a busy intersection right near where they were. And so being bicycles themselves, they're like, there should be something we can do about this. Who is doing something to address these really tragic issues in our community? And so what they did, they went to city council. They attended city council meetings where there were kind of hearings and different discussions being had about this intersection and how to increase traffic safety within this neighborhood more broadly. And as they sat in on some of those sessions, there was a lot of kind of passionate, you know, testimony and kind of thoughts, which obviously this is a highly charged issue. But what they weren't hearing was kind of any rigorous data kind of or kind of any type of explanation that really took into consideration what they as scientists and engineers felt like needed to be a little bit more considerations around like those types of technical issues and kind of what are the practical solutions here. So recognizing that and being engineers by training, um, they went out and collected some of that data. And this is nothing like groundbreaking or earth shattering, but they literally went to that intersection and they looked at it. Kind of like, how long does it actually take a person reasonably to cross this length of an intersection? Um, 
and how long are the signal timings? How well marked are kind of some of those visibility things to help pedestrians and help drivers kind of navigate this intersection? And so they made notes of all this data and they went back to city council, they presented, they delivered public comments. Um, and kind of through this type of advocacy and kind of thanks to their training and their kind of dedication, they were able to really implement some of those changes and kind of make this neighborhood and make this intersection a much safer place. And you kind of use that as a launching point to kind of get involved in a lot other more transportation issues from Houston. You can read about their story and in the interview we did with them in full on our blog, but I really want to offer this as an example of how scientists and engineers, particularly early career scientists and engineers can really make a huge impact make a concrete impact um, kind of on policy issues in your community. Um, so there's lots more of those on our blog. If we jump to the next slide, Maybe you want to be like Catherine and Mary, right? Maybe you want to do this, but that sounds like a lot of work and you're a full-time grad student or whatever, and you don't know how to do that. ESAL is dedicated to lowering that barrier to entry and kind of making it possible for you to do so. One of the ways we do that is our local engagement playbook. I'm showing some snapshots here on the screen here where we help you identify different ways to learn about local engagement, different ways to meet and engage with folks in your community and different ways to actually act. Um, just a couple examples, if you wanna meet with your state legislators or legislative staff, we have a step-by-step -step guide that's like six steps that tells you exactly how to set up those meetings and how to do that. If you wanna be like Catherine and Mary, again, and deliver public comments at a city council meeting or a local commission meeting, we walk you through the concrete steps and how to identify where those meetings are, when they occur, how to deliver effective public comments to make sure your voice is heard. So I encourage you to definitely check out our playbook. And we host a series of events um, kind of at conferences like these at AAAS. We just had a session yesterday injecting science into local decision making. If you didn't catch it, you can catch the recording. We also have for kind of very topical and specific issues. We just had a great session again last week on resilient communities in the face of climate change. We bring in experts and also local policymakers who deal with these issues in their day-to-day -day lives um, to help you kind of develop some of that expertise and kind of interest. So again, if you're interested in that, um, definitely check them out. They occur on a kind of very regular basis and you can definitely find out about them um, by staying connected with us, which I'll provide some more information for. Lastly, I just want to highlight our local engagement workshops. Um, so these are, if you are part of a group, um, whether that's a professional society, a student group, or kind of you just have a community of like-minded STEM folks who want to engage more in your community, but again, you don't know where to start, ESAL offers customized local engagement workshops. We'll come, we'll do a virtual workshop with y'all and we'll work with you in the planning process to kind of really identify what do you want to do in your community and how can we help you get there? Um, so these are very, again, I wanna emphasize really customized detailed workshops so we can help you do that. If you're interested in planning one with us, please, please reach out. And um, we're happy to kind of chat about what that might look like. And with that, I'll just leave you with our contact information. Again, all our social media is there. If you sign up for a monthly newsletter, you'll hear all about our new stories from the blog and upcoming events as well. So I hope you stay in touch and looking forward to chatting more. So much, Chris. That was a lot of information in a short period of time, I know. So thanks for uh, your speed work there. Uh, so over to our next presentation, which is gonna be from Adriana Bankson of JSPG. Uh, the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, or JSPG, is an international open access peer review publication dedicated to elevating students, postdocs, policy fellows, and other early career scholars in science, technology, and innovation policy and governance debates worldwide. So our next panelist, Adriana Bankson, is the CEO and managing publisher of JSPG, and she's going to introduce opportunities to develop your science policy research and writing skills and participate in professional development events organized by the journal. Over to you, Adriana. Thank you, Holly. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Adriana Bankston. I'm currently the CEO and managing publisher for the journal Science Policy and Governance. And our goal is to engage students and early career scholars in science and technology policy. So if you go to the next slide. So I want to provide just a brief background on the journal for those that may not be familiar. So we are internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed publication, as well as a nonprofit. And we've been around since 2011. We serve as a vehicle for students and early career scholars to publish articles concerning every corner of science and technology policy. But I also want to emphasize that we are more than just a journal. So in addition to publications, we bolster research and writing credentials for early career scholars in science policy, and also encourage them to engage in science policy discourse and debate and contribute to policy making at all levels of government. So next slide. We publish in a variety of formats, including op-eds, technology assessments, policy memos, briefs, analyses, 
position papers, white papers, book reviews, workshop proceedings, and other research articles. And you can see here the list of topics that we publish on in science policy. It's quite broad and covers a wide range of policy areas. We also promote the publications through our global mailing list and events. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel where we post all the recordings. So I'm actually, uh, if you want to follow the journal, I'm going to share um, a few of our accounts in the chat um, and also a link to the newsletter where you can keep up to date uh, with our issues and events. So next slide. So we publish two standard issues and two to four special issues a year. Um, standard issues are open call for submissions. Uh, we publish all article formats uh, on all, any topic that we publish on. And then special issues are specifically uh, more focused in scope or topic and are usually sponsored by a partnering organization, um, although we can have sponsors for both of them. Um, eligibility, because we often get this question, um, who can publish in JSPG? So you must be a current student, postdoc, policy fellow, or generally within five years of earning your last degree, and also, or an early career professional. So next slide, thank you. Um, so here are a couple of our current calls for papers. One is for standard issues sponsored by the AAAS Policy Fellowships Program, and we'll have some events associated with this as well. Uh, the other is a special issue on science diplomacy uh, on which we've have held um, some webinars and we have a writing workshop in March. Um, so keep an eye out for that and we'll encourage you to sign up for that as well. And I'm gonna share again the links to the call for papers um, in the chat. Um, so on this slide, as I said, uh, Beyond the publications, we provide opportunities for professional development. So these are a few of the things we do. Um, prior to each issue submission deadline, um, we hold a series of webinars and a writing workshop to help authors prepare their submissions to the issue. Uh, and here's a list of events um, for the diplomacy issue uh, that I mentioned, which you can see on the slide. Uh, and you can watch these recordings uh, on our YouTube channel as well. Uh -oh. Can you see? Oh wait. Can you all see the slides? No. Oh. Okay. Let me just cut up for a second. Okay. Go back to the previous slide. Great. Right. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, we hold webinars and writing workshops prior to our issue deadlines. Um, you can see the ones for the diplomacy issue that I mentioned here. These are also on YouTube. You can watch prior recordings. Um, for our prior issue with AAAS um, STPF a couple of years ago, we held a career panel, which you can see here again. We'll probably do that again uh, in 2022. But I wanted to just share that for standard issues, because they're not focused on a specific topic, uh, we do some sort of career related event. And for the past two years, we have partnered with GPS STEM at UC Irvine and also other groups to offer a virtual uh, international science policy and advocacy certificate program where you can learn uh, fundamentals of science policy, engage in practical exercises, and also network with professionals. Uh, and we'll open the applications again probably in a couple of months, um, so keep an eye out for that as well. And then finally, we currently have applications open for the first cohort uh, of associate editors for the year. Um, this is open until March 6, so you have a couple of weeks to apply. Again, it's a great opportunity to hone your skills in policy writing and editing um, and help shape where future issues go. And again, you can learn more about the program and our editorial board uh, in the chat. So again, I'm gonna share these two things. And you can go to the next slide, please. And in addition to the items I've already mentioned, I just wanted to show a few things that we do for published authors. So in terms of highlighting published work, um, in terms of talks or panels facilitated by our partners. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Some of our authors who published in the special issue on climate change solutions, which was sponsored by the UK Science and Innovation Network, uh, presented their work virtually at the British Embassy, uh, which is the left image. Um, another issue on diversity in science policy that was sponsored by NSPN and published um, in collaboration with SACNIS. 
Um, also, some of the published authors uh, discuss their papers at the Sackness Conference. So these are the kind of things um, that we would organize um, for authors. And then finally, we have a podcast where we interview published authors. Again, it's both on YouTube and SoundCloud. Uh, it's a good way for you to uh, hear from the authors. Again, they can speak about their work, uh, both on video and audio. And again, I'm going to share um, the links to the podcast and uh, SoundCloud as well. So finally, um, we try to increase, increase public engagement around published work. Um, as an example, last year, um, OSCP had an RFI looking for input into diversifying science policy. Uh, and we organized an event around this um, with published authors um, to talk about their ideas and how we might use them to respond to this RFI. And so we did that and uh, was a little bit of a nice kind of real world application of their ideas. Um, we also work to engage the media with published work. So here's a highlight uh, in the bottom right from Northwestern from some of our published authors who are graduate students there. So they co-wrote a paper about diversifying publishing languages besides English. Uh, Northwestern uh, published this highlight, which was nice. And then finally, last year, we started a leadership fireside chat series to talk with our, some of our JSPG advisors and uh, beaters. Um, so as an example, you can see here, we had an engaging chat with Toby Smith, which you may be interested in. It's also on YouTube um, as well as the others. And these chats are usually tied around um, our published is issues. And again, it's a good opportunity to learn from these leaders uh, around timely topics in science policy and how they see um, the value of the journal for the next generation. So I'm also gonna share the page uh, to the leadership chat. Um, you can again, watch those on YouTube. So last slide. And then finally, I've already shared uh, our accounts, but please connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, as well as YouTube and SoundCloud. Um, and again, we encourage you to sign up for the newsletter and apply to the board. Uh, you can see the links on the slide. And then finally, I'm gonna share my contact information as well, uh, if anybody would like to chat further. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. So much going on at JSPG, so I hope folks can, can get involved and get published there. So last but not least, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the National Science Policy Network, or NSPN, which unites groups of early career scientists and engineers nationwide who want to elevate the voice of scientific evidence in policy and advocacy. So our last panelist today is NSPN's Associate Director, Brianna Brown, who will give an overview of the ways NSPN members are able to discover, prepare for, and pursue leadership opportunities in careers in science and policy. Over to you, Brianna. Thanks, Holly. Hello, everyone. So happy to have you here. As Holly mentioned, I'm here to represent the National Science Policy Network. And before we get too deep in, um, for those who are not familiar with what science policy is, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> science policy um, is connecting your expertise in whatever scientific area you come from um, with the needs of the world around you. So through policies, laws, uh, advocacy, Etc. And the cool thing about science policy is that there's a place here for everyone. Um, and so you may hear the phrase science for policy or policy for science. Next slide. <laughs> and um, so those sometimes are used interchangeably, but science for policy is when you use your expertise to improve decision making. Um, and then policy for science is when you want to advocate um, for some type of decision making on how to fund or structure your scientific initiative. Um, and so you take all of that and then we can move forward to the next slide and talk about how um, science policy careers make that happen. Um, and so science policy professionals um, are interested in how science and technology can impact those laws and regulations in different communities. Um, and when we talk about, you know, the areas that you can go with science policy careers and how you can enter sect your area of expertise on the next slide, um, you'll see that there's a lot of range. Um, there's health policy, environmental policy, water, transportation, agriculture, food policy. Um, it's a little bit of everything that you can think of. Anything you think has a cause um, should be advocated for. You can find a place where STEM um, is behind that as well. So on the next slide, 
we'll dig a little bit deeper um, and talk about more areas. So I have a K-12 background, um, my, my bachelor's in biology, um, but even K-12 STEM education is a thing, housing, insurance, human services, um, labor. Um, and so just kind of giving you an idea of where STEM um, is in all of these things and just letting you know that there is a place where you can do policy with them as well. And on the next slide, we'll talk about some of this common science policy fields. And so you may be wondering, you know, where is my place here? What can I do? Maybe you don't want to uh, go write policy, but you can do communication and advocacy and tell a story, make science accessible to different populations. Maybe you're like, I want to change the world. I want to go global. And you can do science diplomacy and um, cross intersect with uh, foreign agencies about what's important to them and what's important to us. You can also work right in our backyard with the FDA or NIH and groups like that and make sure that funding is going to the appropriate sources and where you think that funding should be going to. Um, so there's a lot of range and a lot of different avenues. Um, and on the next slide, we'll talk about different places where you can do science policy. And so it's, it's all over the place. Again, you can do anything from Twitter has policy people um, at their organization now, but also places like AAAS, um, Research America, NSPN, um, the federal government, and maybe you're feeling like, you know, Brianna, I'm not really ready to jump into a full-fledged career. There's also opportunities to do a lot of training programs, take courses, um, or even do a fellowship. And the cool thing about fellowships is you're learning more about the fields. You're also getting to use your expertise to do a little bit of uh, informed decision making, but they're also paid. So, you know, it's important that you're compensated for your time and your expertise and that you are making the most of all of your experiences holistically. So, um, if you're not ready for a full-fledged career, fellowships work, and then, again, there's also internships, training programs, and volunteering, as well as my peers have mentioned. Um, and so what can you do right now? Like, if you wanted to say, I'm ready to get started in science policy today, I'm ready to uh, be an advocate for, you know, whatever you're ready to advocate for. Um, well, I would first suggest learn as much as you can. We're going to drop some links um, in the breakout rooms about resource guides, uh, graduate education, our graduate education committee came up with the whole curriculum, a bunch of modules that you can read. Again, there's uh, courses you can take, um, but also, you know, at your community, if you're at a university, join a student government. Um, if you can sit on a board, if you can go to any kind of sessions, listen, um, go to Hill Days, things like that. There's a lot that you can do, and I'm sure many of you already possess the skills that you need to be actively engaged um, in these different communities, you know. Are you curious? Do you have analytical skills? Are you resilient? Um, ready to go answer the questions that are unanswered. Um, and more importantly, we want you to build a community, find some hashtag SciPaw pals around you. And so that's where NSPN comes in. And we are here on the next slide to help you build a community, get some training programs and um, empower you to go do what you'd like to do and advocate what you'd like to advocate for. So our groups host um, workshops, events. We have an annual symposium training programs. We have committees, again, like I said, the Graduate Education Committee, Communications Committee, 10 committees that you can get in and uh, practice your skills before you go out into the SciPaw space. Um, and so we'd love to connect with you and be your SciPaw pal. Feel free to add us on Twitter um, or connect with someone that you meet from this session um, or, again, on Twitter. That's the next slide, Holly, but that's it. But thank you all. And let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Brianna, and, and thanks to all of our speakers for going through so much content. I know we have a short time in the workshop space, but I think we finished early enough that we're going to have some time to do breakout rooms. So participants, just so you guys know, you're going to be invited to join a breakout room. You'll have the chance to turn on your video and audio if you'd like to um, and have a discussion. Um, and we have some, um, I'll put this link in the chat, or maybe one of the panelists could drop the link to this in the chat. Um, but I'll point out at the bottom, all of our panelists have put all the resources they've talked about and more links here to this Google Doc that everyone will be welcome um, to edit and view um, and click away and discuss as a group. But the, the questions we'd love to have you guys talking about in your breakout rooms uh, are up here at the top. So first of all, what science policy resources or ideas that you've learned about from this session or throughout the whole AAAS annual meeting? Are you ready or excited or curious about putting into action? And then what can the three organizations represented here do to help you be successful in whatever it is that's your science or policy or science policy goals uh, from there? So let's start by putting this link in the chat if it's not already. Oh, it is already. Brianna put it in there. We'll also jump into the breakout rooms and we can share it again. Um, but I'll go ahead and 
set those up. Mm -hmm.